a very warm welcome to the guests, the compassionate community, the students, Chancellor Costa, Carrie Hessler, panel of experts, community leaders, academic experts, colleagues. No More, No More is a program by Social Impact UC San Diego, committed to raise awareness, bring experts together, make strategic plans, follow up on action and solutions in the critical global tragic issue of human trafficking in San Diego and the world. We want UC San Diego to be the leaders, to pave the path and raise awareness with partners like PCI. Thank you, Carrie, for signing the contracts with Chancellor Kosla. We want our students to be transformation leaders, leaders who lead with empathy and compassion. 20 years ago, I witnessed a deep difference between poverty and privilege. Coming from Bangladesh, the violence, the rape of children and girls, I saw flesh trade in Shonagachi in India. It wounded me, saddened me to a point of dissolution. I felt deep anger and helplessness. Seeing the injustice of the world, I constantly felt I had to do something. We had to do something. The realization led to great responsibility, a responsibility I take very seriously. Coming to USA, I saw nothing was different. If not, it was much more. The pain was much more to see an advanced country going through the same thing, but the biggest hope was we have platforms like UC San Diego and now PCI to join us and collaborate to take it forward together. We cannot blame poverty and underserved all the time. The harsh realization is no community or society is left out of it. Thanks to our chancellor, his relentless support, and PCI to allow us to come together in a bid to bring in commitment, action, and lasting solutions to this critical issue. Last month, we were in UN Sec uh, General Assembly. Carrie was with me. And then I attended the UN Global Compact. The burning agenda from number 17 to number three was human trafficking. It was number 17 at one point. I'm wearing the badge of 17 sustainable goals. It's gone up to number three right now. And my biggest fear, I do have a fear. 25 years ago, we were not taking account of the climate change issue seriously. Yet today, it's a reality. Unanimously recognized as a deep danger to our planet. I fear in the same way. If today we don't give time and effort to ensure the values, deep values, which are, if they're not nurtured within us, we may find thrust upon us a world which will be starved of people, of character and value in the years to come. The most sustainable thing for us would be to practice compassion and empathy on a daily basis with our families, communities, and whoever we come in touch with. All of us here in this room, we are part of the change. We need a world of humility, trust, courage, love, respect, tolerance, inclusion, liberty, in pursuit of happiness. The vision is not enough. I totally understand. We need total dedication with action plans and solutions. When you saw the line that your eyes do not see what your mind does not know. From the time I have been in San Diego, there have been pockets of circles in the society, in the, the niche social circle. People have decided to block this issue. And we realize that this issue is becoming more and more only because of our silence. When we are silent, the perpetrators get a ground to grow and grow. When we were younger, we were told not to talk about rape. Human trafficking was even absolutely a banned topic. But the more we kept quiet, the silence gave them strength. Our voice together will ensure that we weaken their growth by our collaboration. Know that silence, denial, disconnected, allows the perpetrator to grow unseen. The more we talk, we are aware, and we weaken their strength. And know that for our students here today, it is OK to talk. There's nothing wrong in talking, nothing wrong in getting educated and informed. There's definitely a disconnect in the society. I'll tell you an example. Last week, I was having lunch with a donor. And it took me two hours to convince her. She said, my children go to private school, and one of them would be going to university. I kept on and on telling her, 
that this is what the problem and it's a problem for us in our backyard. We cannot deny it. It's going to hit us one day if we deny it. Then while I was walking back, I felt a little sad that I kind of felt that I didn't touch her soul, which usually I can. But while I was walking back to my office, I found this text from her. And I think she's in the crowd today. And thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you for all UC San Diego does for our boys and girls. Put there everywhere. You all are the protector of their futures and their happiness as well as that of those who don't even know they need, they need you yet. My heart as a mother of two beautiful children, thank you from the depth of my soul. With this, I invite my mentor, our Honorable Chancellor, Pradeep Kausla, to officially start the program. Thank you. Thank you, Naila. I think what she wanted to say was she was a warm-up act. <laughs> I am the next warm-up act. Uh, and I was listening to Naila. I was wondering, uh, this is actually an amazing program, and I was just wondering about the various forms of human ill that exists out there uh, that really leads to us abusing other human beings. And I think if you think about uh, child labor, if you think about sexual exploitation, if you think about drug dealing, um, all of these in one form or the other, I think are a subset of this form called human trafficking. I think human trafficking really takes the cake in terms of uh, when it comes to abusing uh, our weaknesses. And if you think that human trafficking happens only to people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, you'd be mistaken. In fact, if you look at uh, the statistics, uh, it might be predominantly lower socioeconomic backgrounds, but people from middle, upper middle class and very high income, gr income groups are also uh, affected by this because this is not just about poverty, which might be primarily the reason. It's also about low self-esteem. It's about uh, low confidence and a whole lot of emotional issues that happen to just about all of us equally distributed across the socio socioeconomic backgrounds. So then you might say, okay, so why is you, UC San Diego, interested in this? Um, I'll get to that in a second, but let me also add then that I was just reading about this somewhere that of all the forms of illegal income, illegal activities, human trafficking is number three in the world. It's like, no, so I'm not surprised it's on the number three on the UN list, right? Uh, it's about more, it's nearly more than $150 billion enterprise uh, with about two-thirds of it coming from sexual exploitation primarily. Okay, so why would UC San Diego be interested in this? So the way I see our role as UC, at UC San Diego as a public university, but also as one of the leading universities in the country, we have to do anything and everything that has a very positive impact on society. And creating knowledge clearly is one way to impact society. Educating our kids, uh, boys and girls, young men and women, is another way of, it, of impacting society. I think a third of impacting society is bringing our social awareness to our work every day and understanding what are the various forms of human ill. Why do they happen? How does one mitigate their impact? How does one eradicate them? And this is, in my mind, an important part of who we are as a public university. It's an important part of who we are also as activists. And, and you know that a lot of uh, change in the world happens because of activism at universities, because of activism of the young men and women who go to universities, because of the activism of the faculty uh, and staff who go to universities. I'm not saying start protesting right now, but, <laughs> but I am saying that we need to be aware of that because universities are the cause of significant change in society, and apartheid being a great example of the universities in the U.S. I think had a very big impact, including universities in other countries. As I look at UC San Diego, there's two things that come to mind that are of real, really great significance out here. One is the Center on Global Justice run by Afana Foreman. It existed long before the MOU today. It's a center that thinks about how does one lead to a more equitable, more just society. Uh, the other is Center on Gender Equity, which also thinks about uh, how does one create equity amongst genders. So you put it all together, uh, the point I'm trying to make in a long-winded manner is that you could not have found a better place than UC San Diego to do this. And we could not have found a better partner than PCI. Um, actually, Ann Otterson, who used to be involved here, was 
a dear friend, uh, and she adopted me when I came to San Diego, so I feel kind of committed to PCI clearly for UC uh, at the San Diego level. But PCI in the country, I think, has done, uh, your mission is just spectacular. It's exactly the right mission. It's a mission we can support. It's a mission we uh, identify with, and it's a mission that we want to be a part of. So Kerry Hessler, the CEO of uh, uh, PCI International is here, and I'm here, greatly honored to be signing this MOU. So thank you very much, everybody. Carrie's uh, bio is 10 page long, but I'll try to just introduce her so that you all know what she is, and I'll introduce her the way I know her. Carrie Hessler is the president and CEO of Project Concern International. PCI is a global development organization working with families and communities in 16 countries. She was the director of Peace Corp from 2012 to 2017. She served as the deputy director in 2010, and she, has been, she was appointed by President Obama and worked as vice president and director of Washington, D.C. office of Jon Snow as well. From what I know of Carrie Hessler from the time I know Today, Union Tribune editor is not here, Jeff Light. I happened to meet him in a program, and then he sent a mail to Carrie and me that you two must meet. And I thank him so much. From that day, we didn't look back. And we spent many days together. And I can't even tell you or start telling you that she's one of the most compassionate leader, a woman leader I have known and I look up to. There's been days of brainstorming on how we'll change the world together. And I know she's a big asset to all of us and UC San Diego as partners. And I tell her she's my soul sister. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you for coming into my life and our lives now. Thank you, Carrie Hessler. Hello, everyone. It is just wonderful to see this audience packed. Um, before I start, I really want to thank Chancellor Kosla for your extraordinary leadership and vision. Um, there aren't too many chancellors or presidents of universities across the country that are taking this on as a major issue, and you outline very well the reasons for it. But it is such an honor and a pleasure to be able to be your partner, and I'm so happy that we memorialized it with an MOU. So thank you. I also want to thank the extraordinary Nyla Chowdhury, who is my soul sister and is really um, a person who has spent her whole life elevating human dignity and making the world a better place. And it is a privilege to be your friend and colleague. I also want to thank so many of you here who have dedicated your life to helping our community. Uh, those of you who are exhibiting, those of you who were, are representatives of uh, social services, those of you who are volunteers. I know we have a big group from UBS that has done so much to support this initiative. Um, my own team at PCI, I'm grateful for your being here. This is a community effort. It's going to take a community effort, and I especially am grateful for all the students here. So thank you for spending your afternoon with us. So right now, it's roughly a uh, quarter after 4, 4.30. Students from across San Diego are going home. So imagine you're one of them, an eight-year-old girl who's just started third grade. But instead of meeting up with friends, playing after school, or doing your homework, your mother has other plans for you. Your mother is a young, single parent who just recently lost her job and she is desperate to pay the bills. She has also fallen deep in, deep, deeply into a drug habit, and she needs money to support her habit. So as a last resort, she asks for your help, and she introduces you to someone she calls a friend. This man proceeds to sec sexually assault you in exchange for cash, an arrangement that continues for many years. By the time you are 13, you're being sold on the street, and you eventually end up pregnant at the hands of your pimp, who beats you so badly that you have a miscarriage. Now, while this might sound like a far-fetched story that's designed to shock all of us, this is, in fact, a story that happened right here in San Diego, less than 10 miles from this auditorium. This is a story of a survivor. She is one of 5,000 or more who live right now in San Diego. 
She's also one of the 4.5 million people around the world who are trapped in forced sexual exploitation. Think about this for one moment. 5,000 people at least, the number's up to as high as 8,000, we're not really sure. People here in our city, mostly girls, but also boys, who are bound by the invisible chains of modern day slavery right here underneath our noses. According to the FBI, and I'm happy there are some members of the FBI here today. According to the FBI, San Diego was among the top 13 cities in the United States known for prostitution of children. So even though we'd like to think that these unspeakable crimes are happening far away in distant corners of the, of the world, they are happening right here among us. In fact, here are just a few of the statistics that you've already heard a few from the uh, chancellor, but let me tell you a few more. As per the 2016 study conducted by Dr. Jamie Gates of PLNU and Dr. Amy Cartner, Carpenter of USD, the sex trafficking industry here in San Diego alone is an $810 million industry. It's second only to drug trafficking in the underground world. Locally, the average age of entry is 16 years. There are some who are younger, and of course there are some that are older, but 16 is the average age of entry. It's not just a crime that happens in the inner cities. Girls and boys, young men and women, are trafficked from every single zip code in San Diego County. It is highly likely that here in this audience today, there are people whose lives have been touched by human trafficking. It is present right here on this campus. There are over 200 suspected illicit massage businesses where both labor and sex trafficking takes place within the San Diego limits. Those are the ones we know about. The peak time when buyers are responding to sex ads online on websites like Backpage.com, the peak time is between 10 a.m. and 12 a.m. Monday through Friday. They are generally at work or at school. They are on work time, on work property, using work devices in order to order sex for dates after work. That's why every workplace and indeed every university needs to be concerned about trafficking, if only from a time management perspective. But it is a serious problem and our businesses are the playgrounds for this. There are an estimated 38,000 victims of labor trafficking here in San Diego. Thankfully, we have an extraordinary community of people who really care about this issue here. We have concerned citizens, victims advocates, political leaders, researchers, social service providers, law enforcement officers, university members, all who work tirelessly every single day to recover and support victims and survivors of human trafficking. They raise awareness about the issue and they advocate for change. And we, we hope all of us here will become members of this group. We also recognize the hard work of the San Diego Regional Human Trafficking and Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children Advisory Council and many others who are becoming involved in this movement. But it is not enough. It is simply not enough. Many people remain unaware that human trafficking is happening all around us and that we all have a role to play. We need greater awareness. Every single family needs to know about this. We need more shelters and more services for survivors. We need more prosecutions of traffickers and buyers, and we need stronger partnerships. We especially need to focus on preventing sexual uh, trafficking of, of children. We need to address its root causes, we need to identify the risk factors associated with youth vulnerability, and we need to provide them with the protection, education, mentoring, love, guidance, and support that they need and deserve. Now, PCI is working with many of you here, including UCSD, to address this issue of primary prevention of sex trafficking, especially among children. As a health and humanitarian organization that works to empower people and communities to overcome hardship, we are very well positioned to support local efforts to prevent trafficking and address the conditions that make youth vulnerable. So we have four major uh, pillars of our work. Our first is an empowering and educating youth. PCI's Girls Only program is designed to promote self-esteem, develop life skills, and inspire positive motivation in young girls 
who are at risk of commercial sexual exploitation. We educate them starting at age 11 about the tactics used by traffickers so that they can identify when it's happening and they can respond knowingly with knowledge and understanding. Partners include the Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater San Diego Area and the San Diego Unified School District Primetime Program. We also plan to expand programming to boys age 15, 8 to 15 because boys are trafficked too. And we also need to raise boys and young men who are committed to saying no to sexual exploitation of, of children and women. So the second thing we do is we raise public awareness. PCI conducts Human Trafficking 101 trainings to broaden community awareness of the issue and increase the number of sex and labor trafficking victims who are identified and supported to leave the industry. In fact, in partnership with the county school districts and the health departments, our primary targets for the training are actually our, our physicians, our health workers, our teachers, because they are in first responder positions to identify sexual assault and human trafficking when they see these uh, young people in their clinics or in their schools. So it's really important to train them as first responders so that they can reach out to others who are trained to, to help these young people. We also work with others to reduce demand for sex trafficking, and this is a tough one. PCI is a collaborative partner with the CEASE network, which operates with, within 12 um, cities around the country that is trying to reduce demand for illegal commercial sex throughout the United States. So each city is committed to using best practice and innovation and evidence and strategies with proven impact on reducing the demand of, of sex trafficking services. And a big part of this is educating buyers, <coughs> educating buyers that apart from the traffic traffickers themselves, most of the people who engage in the commercial sex industry, and that includes pornography, are there against their will. And that buyers, when they procure sex or when they view pornography, they are contributing directly to the exploitation of those persons. That is something that many people don't think about, that by engaging in this industry, they are directly responsible for extending human trafficking and the exploitation of those persons. Lastly, we're very involved in building a coalition of interested and involving people, and that's part of what we were doing here today. Recognizing that local, local universities and businesses have a really important place, role to play on educating their employees and educating students, we have formed a brand new coalition. It's a business alliance, anti-trafficking business alliance. This brand new coalition of San Diego business organizations is implementing best practices and the um, activities that each workplace um, chooses to implement is going to be different depending on that particular business, but examples include adopting policies that prohibit sex buying on work or university prop property or time, educating students or employees on the issue, supporting local anti-trafficking organizations, and creating uh, job opportunities for survivors. So these are some of the things that we're doing with our business alliance. And I am delighted that as of today, PCI and UCSD are formally working together. And that's so important because UCSD is San Diego County's largest employer. So that's a huge um, show of support for us. And we're very, very grateful to you, Chancellor. So I'm going to end with a story that's going to hit, I think, probably very close to home for some of you. So this is the story of Zoe, and Zoe is not actually her real name, but she is a bright and highly motivated psych major who, like many students in many places, was a little short on cash. So when she was approached by a woman who claimed that she was a representative of a, a sports marketing apparel firm and offered to pay Zoe about 100 bucks if she would be willing to model sportswear, it sounded like a great way to pick up some easy money. So off she went to the modeling studio a few days later. She filled out a simple application form and posed for photos, wearing tennis gear and swimwear. As she headed out the door with her cash in hand, she made an appointment to return the following day for more photos. She seemed like a really great way to make money quickly. Only the next time, 
After she had donned her swimwear, she was met by a very large, fierce-looking man who told her to remove her clothes and join a male model in the studio for some action shots. When she refused, he grabbed her by the arm and physically threatened her. Zoe was trapped, and she had no choice but to do as he asked. Her only thought at that time was getting out of there alive. By now, they had her application form, they knew where she lived, and there were compromising photos of her, and the traffickers told her that they were gonna post them on Facebook, that they were gonna send them to her parents, that they were gonna email them to her professors. They also told her that they knew where her family lived and her younger sister lived, and that they would harm her, her younger sister, if Zoe did not do what they asked. They began to demand that she took on clients in hotel rooms. Zoe was completely and totally trapped. She was humiliated, she was terrified, and she was thoroughly enslaved. And she so feared their wrath and was so thoroughly convinced of their willingness to use violence that it was easier for her to comply than to fight them. According to Zoe, she became a mere shadow of herself. She fell deeper and deeper into depression and fear and hopelessness. She stopped study studying and almost never went to class because she feared that her fellow classmates would see the cuts and bruises that had been given to her by her client and her pimps. Life was almost unbearable. Now, fortunately for Zoe, she has tremendous courage and tremendous strength and she eventually was able to break free of her bondage. She went through a program to give her counseling and support and the tools she needed to move beyond this terrible chapter in her life. Now she is once again back in school, she's performing well, and she is optimistic about the future. But what happened to Zoe could happen to anyone here. It started out so innocently, and it quickly snowballed beyond her control. Happily, though, more and more universities like UCSD are working with their students, are organizing efforts such as this to educate their teachers and their students and their employees about the dangers of sex trafficking, the red flags, the tactics that traffickers use, and how you can respond to get yourself out of there safely. We are so proud to be your partners. We all need to strike back at this terrible crime against human dignity and the criminals who benefit from this and they are getting rich on this on the flesh trade we need to stand for human dignity and we need to do so by banding together implementing best practices and known strategies and working together attacking it from every single angle each and every one of us so i ask each of us who are sitting here today to find your place in the fight against human trafficking whether it's by educating a friend or a family member, by reaching out to someone who's struggling, because as you know, as we heard from the chancellor, people who are isolated and detached from others are vulnerable. So if you see someone who's struggling, reach out to them. There is nothing more powerful than human connection. Whether it's conducting research on the vulnerabilities, whether it's supporting local victim services, by joining our alliance, or by having the courage to stand up and say no to human trafficking, or to pornography, or to commercial sex when you see it, especially among your peers. It's time for each and every one of us to stand up and play our role. It's such a privilege to be here. Thank you for your partnership. And thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Few people asked me how the program flow would be. We have our FBI partner, Todd Hemmen, who's going to speak for three, four minutes. Uh, where's Todd? Yeah, come here. And right after that, we'll have a panel discussion. We have students from UC San Diego Theater Group who would be acting out real stories, what's going on in campuses. These stories are collected from actual experiences. Then we have a survivor who would tell her story and sing. She's a very famous singer. So here's Todd Hemmen. Well, thank you all for being here today. Uh, and I'm just 
want to say it's really encouraging to see um, so many people getting together and becoming more aware of human trafficking and wanting to get involved. Um, the statistics for human trafficking, and you've heard them a couple different times already, are pretty overwhelming uh, and pretty intimidating. And I will tell you as a law enforcement officer, uh, truly it is one case at a time um, in how we approach and how we combat human trafficking. Uh, I love what I've heard so far today about working together. Uh, I will tell you just as, again, a law enforcement officer, um, our engagement with the local and the state and other federal law enforcement agencies specifically for human trafficking um, has been very powerful and it's really provided a force multiplier um, towards fighting human trafficking. In San Diego County alone, we have great relationships uh, amongst all law enforcement agencies uh, and it really is an encouragement to see everyone coming together to fight uh, what really is becoming an epidemic. Um, the problem is that uh, despite all the agencies that are involved, we are all at capacity, we're all busy um, all the time. Leads, uh, new cases continually come in, which uh, I believe just speaks more and more to the problem of human trafficking. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about, and I just have a few minutes with you all today, is um, our mindset with human trafficking cases. Um, so with a lot of cases that we work as law enforcement, they are very um, evidence-driven. So you're trying to gather enough evidence so that you can prosecute a case. Human trafficking is unique in that we approach it with what we call a victim-centered mindset. Um, the focus in human trafficking cases really, um, and, it, and it does differ from other cases, the focus is really the victim first, uh, and that's appropriate. So when we uh, are investigating a case and we uh, happen to recover a victim, and, and victim is words that we use, survivor, uh, there, there's multiple words to describe um, the individuals that unfortunately are caught up in human trafficking. A uh, victim is, is a term that we embrace, so just know that um, from my perspective, those, those terms are interchangeable, but I'm gonna use victim um, to describe these individuals. So when we come across a victim, uh, our first priority is to get them needed services. Um, that can look uh, different with every victim. It can be housing, it can be medical attention, it can be just distancing them from their trafficker. Um, but we, we make that our priority first and foremost. We have a team of social workers on staff, our victim specialists, um, whose specialty is dealing and working with these victims. Now they are also conduits to more services, um, uh, more detailed and more long-term services. Um, but for us, before anything else, we want to make sure the victim's taken care of. Now, that has the added benefit, hopefully, of getting uh, their cooperation, of letting them see that um, despite having been trafficked and, and abused, whether that's mental or physical, um, by someone for so long, we are on their side. Uh, and we do want to put those traffickers in jail. We do want to prosecute. Um, but first and foremost, we focus on the victim. Uh, and in these cases, it's, it's appropriate to do so. Um, so in that spirit, as we're talking about collaboration and how um, law enforcement wants to continue to engage with NGOs and nonprofits and concerned community citizens, uh, I think there are ample opportunities to get involved and, and really to be part of that process, whether that's volunteering your time, uh, financial resources are always needed. Uh, in whatever capacity that looks like for you all, I do encourage you to continue um, to seek out how you can be involved in, in fighting human trafficking. Um, so that is really what I wanted to discuss with you all today. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for your attention to uh, human trafficking. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Neville. Um, I was a student here. I'm on the alumni board. I've been teaching martial arts here on campus for 36 years this week. My wife is not here because she's teaching a women's self-defense empowerment class starting in about 12 minutes. And I had a daughter, I still have a daughter, <laughs> when she was younger on a beach in Cardiff one day, she was attempted to be abducted, but they could not prosecute because there was no physical contact. So I relate to this topic in a multitude of ways, as many of us in the room do. And I'm going to invite our esteemed panel. I've been asked by Nyla to facilitate the panel. So would my beloved panel please come up to the stage and let's have some house lights for them, please. Um, you know who you are. Come on now. So for the edific, please have a seat, relax, make yourself at home. I'll get you chai and coffee in a minute here. Um, so starting 
To my immediate left is Dr. Suresh Subramani. Uh, next to him is sitting down right now is Ms. Carmen Kant. And then Dr. Ramesh Rao. <laughs> uh, sorry, Le Leanne Urada. And uh, at the end is Ramesh Rao, Dr. Ramesh Rao. So uh, as you have obviously been and experienced multiple panels in lieu of spending a long time on copious introductions that often type suck up all the time. And you can, with Google, probably Google all these guys and figure out who they are and why they're here. I thought it'd be more relevant and resonant given the topic for each of them to take a few minutes and personally speak to two aspects of why they're on this panel today, why they're here with you today, why we're all here today. The first is a heart question, the why. why what, what called you from your heart? And the other is a head question, given a bias for action and evidence-based approaches to addressing this issue, uh, what, what, what are some of the things we can think about and how should we think about it through your lens, through your experience, through your wisdom? So a head question, a heart question. Uh, we can go in no particular order, but we'll go with the closest to today's birthday. So who is that? Come on now. You didn't have to give us the year. Oh, shoot, November. Ah, tag you're it. Would you, would you mind starting? So in your own words. So I'm an assistant professor at San Diego State University in social work, and I've been assistant professor here in School of Medicine and uh, Global Public Health for the past several years. And uh, um, primarily I've been an HIV researcher in countries like the Philippines and in Tijuana, Mexico, um, actually for many years. And I've been working with you know, hundreds of uh, girls and women who have been trapped in th these, this um, entertainment industry, working in bars, massage parlors, nightclubs, and hearing all of their stories. But as an HIV researcher, I was primarily working around HIV prevention. And it's, uh, it's, it's very um, disheartening because everyone is trapped in, in this industry. Now that I'm um, focusing more on San Diego County as um, part of the uh, a co chair of the uh, research subcommittee of the San Diego County Advisory um, Council that was mentioned earlier, that's really combating, trying to combat. Um, uh, making a collective impact together um, across all these industries, uh, law enforcement, child uh, welfare services, um, victim services, um, uh, academia, researchers, um, many sectors coming together to combat this issue. I, I can't come back to this question. Well, I came back to this question. Why, um, where is the intersection between HIV and human trafficking? And what I realized in, um, research and also my social work students who are very, very interested in this topic um, and he they're hearing stories, is that um, really the young, the young population is being targeted because they're most likely not HIV infected. So we have, you know, 80% of, um, up to 80% of foster youth, uh, um, of those who are being trafficked are, are foster youth form or former foster youth. Um, we have as young as 13, 14, the average age at San Diego County, that one study was 16, but really nationally, they say 13, four, as early as 13, 14 years old. Youth are being targeted. Every high school is um, being targeted. Uh, I have colleagues in social work who say that uh, their friends are um, pulling all of their daughters out of the high schools, out of uh, at least three, these three high schools in San Diego County because they're constantly being recruited. Um, and so thank you for your earlier stories because I've, heard these stories, um, everybody is uh, targeted, you know, whether you're a vulnerable foster youth or a uh, lesbian, gay, transgender individual who's been kicked out of their home to um, a college student who's being forced coerced into this work. Um, and I think just lastly uh, is that I think we really have to look at uh, why is there a cultural intolerance for this mm -hmm. for so many years and generations, but also why are we all coming together now and really trying to make an impact that's also encouraging. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's no, yes, would you like to go next, Carmen? I was gonna say there's no method of madness we can go boy, go, boy, go, but if you're up for it, man, just take over. <laughs> can you hear Carmen? Keep talking, he'll probably turn it up. Yeah, he'll turn it up. Yeah, if you, if you just start talking to him, we'll see. Hello, there yeah, you go. okay. Well, I'm gonna follow what they told me. Two minutes for introduction, two minutes to talk, okay? Okay, deal. Okay. <laughs> because I cannot make it shorter. 
Yeah. I did it before, and I timed myself and say, oh, no, my God, it's too long. <laughs> anyway, okay, thank you very much for this invitation, for the opportunity to talk about human trafficking. A special thanks to the organizers, to put uh, the one who put this conference together, and to my dear friends Naila and Ferosa, that they, these women are amazing. Really, I don't know what else can I say about them. Thank you so much. Okay, my name is Carmen Com, and I am an attorney from Peru. I have a post title in international law on human rights. I served the Superior Court in my country for 10 years as a family judge and juvenile judge. I was a law professor in two universities and I worked for United Nations. I was in charge of the prisoners in my country. Uh, I am a freelance writer. writer. I am a passionate believer of human rights. I am still a dreamer. And for reasons that I were not in my plans, I ended up in this country with a, with a political asylum. Now I'm working with victims, uh, still working with victims after 33 years from a different perspective. Now I'm not doing, I'm not making judicial decisions, but I'm working as an advocate. So I am interacting with victims of trafficking for many years. I started in Peru when, in the times when nobody called them human trafficking victims. There was not even that word. I mean, nobody used it. But now in, here in the United States, we start officially talking about human trafficking in the year 2000 when government passed the first comprehensive federal law to address trafficking in persons. So this is kind of new, no? 2000 is just here. Uh, so that's why maybe I, when I still go places and people ask me, what do I do? What kind of work I have? I say I work with human trafficking victims. And they ask me, what is that? And just to make a short answer, an easy answer, I said, well, they are slaves. And there comes the other question, do we still have slaves? Yes, it is a shame to say it, but we are in 2017 and we have slaves. Currently, I am working in, a, in La Maestra Community Health Centers and I am in charge of the international human trafficking there. And so far, I mean, I am six years working in that program. That's my baby, baby program since day one. And I was able to serve 120 victims of trafficking. So I can tell you 120 stories, <laughs> real stories. For, from people who come from 21 different countries. The majority of them are adults, victims of sex trafficking, females. Right now I have 23 open cases, and from those 23 open cases, 13 are transgender individuals, male to female. So working with LGBT people is, is, a, is a dream come true to me, because that was, I was not able to do that in my country. I learn from them every day. I admire them. Because I, I ask myself sometimes, from where these people get the strength to wake up every morning and face life? Because almost every place they go, they get bullied. One of my clients told me that when she gets into the bus, people move around. And they start looking at them and, is it a man? Is that a woman? You know, things like that. Another of my clients told me that in, in a liquor store in Hillcrest, she get inside to buy something and the cashier or the owner told her, get out of my place. You are not allowed to come here. And he just threw her out. She called the police, and the police said they cannot help her. Well, if I have to write a manual on how to interact with these clients, I will not know how to do it. I guess it's something that comes with you. I think it's a special ability or maybe a gift that people, special people has. And has to do with, with how much you love another human being, how much you care about somebody else how sharp or, or smart you can be connecting services and resources in order to help, in order to help. How respectful you must be, how empathic you can be. Some clients are easy to start a conversation, but most of them are not. Most of them are afraid. They don't understand what has happened to them. Sometimes they don't even identify themselves as a victims. Sometimes they think it's okay to work in exchange to have a roof over her head or for food. Sometimes they think it's okay to be working or helping the family because they are in love with the trafficker or because the trafficker maybe is the father of their kids. So it's not easy because they don't trust the system. Um, unfortunately, I, I have to say it. I know we have here my friends from, uh, from FBI. I love them so much. They are very, very helpful, okay? But not, not everybody is like that. So some clients, they don't trust the system. Some clients, they don't trust law enforcement. I'm sorry to say it. Some, cli some clients, they told me that they went to a healthcare facility 
One of my clients, she had a four abortions in the same place in North County. And nobody asked her, Why, what is going on with you? Do you need any help? See? So, and she was doing this. She was obligated to, to have these abortions because the trafficker um, pushed her to do it. Otherwise, she cannot I mean, make any profit for him, you know, being, being pregnant. So it's not easy to talk with them, but when you make a connection with the client, and when the client start open, open their self, himself or herself, and telling you the story, they start loving you, they trust you, and that is a feeling that I cannot explain to you. You know, that is a feeling that doesn't have pr a price. Uh, that is a feeling that makes you laugh or make you smile even when you are alone and people think you're crazy. But you are just feeling so happy because you are not changing a machine, you are not making better a, a beautiful house, you are helping a human being, you know? So it's very important to know that anyone can be a victim of human trafficking, anyone. And doesn't have nothing to do with being illiterate or poor. Maybe yes, more with them, but can happen to anyone. I have clients who are engineers. I have clients who are from the administration field. Um, they went to college, or like you just said, can happen to anyone. So we have to be very aware of that. Um, and with her permission, I'm, I'm gonna introduce you with my former client. She's here, this beautiful girl. She's a singer. She's a professional from the healthcare uh, feel she's the president of activist san diego see she's a singer and she's a songwriter i'm very proud of you john <laughs> so we need to break those stigmas and open our minds to understand that uh, can happen to anyone but there is but it's true that there are vulnerable populations and lately I can tell about two vulnerable populations, in my opinion. It's from natural disasters and from the refugee crisis. Now, how we can help them? We are having a good start point connecting ourselves in this conference. And this conference is, is about this, no? to get connected. We need to know who are there providing services to victims of trafficking. Real services, not beautiful websites, OK? Real services. We don't need to discourage them again. They were trafficked because somebody lied to them with false promises. And if we are gonna help a victim, we need to offer what we are really willing to do. When we, do, when we don't follow what we promise, we are re-victimizing them. To finish, I want to say that this is not my work, this is my passion. To help and offer services and to, to offer a new life to somebody it's not like promises. I have to make it happen. I invite you to keep connected, to speak out and denounce if you see something wrong. I invite you to continue this conversation with friends and family. We are privileged to be here. We have knowledge. We have possibilities. We speak English. I hope I speak English. <laughs> we have immigration status. We are safe. And for all of this, we need to stand together and we keep doing our best to rescue humans from exploitation and abuse. Thank you. So uh, let me jump in here. Uh, my name is Ramesh Rao. Uh, I'm trained as an electrical engineer. And one of the things uh, that you learn early on as an engineer is to solve problems. Uh, you're very dissatisfied if you just learn about the existence of a problem. You want to do something about it. So part of my personal struggle, speaking from the heart, uh, getting familiar and getting sensitized to the problem of human trafficking is exactly that. What are we going to do? So I was very happy to hear Carmen comment on that. Uh, I think uh, awareness by itself is probably very valuable, but I think for many of us, only when it turns into something that produces change, can claim to have addressed the issue. Uh, switching gears a little bit, you know, it's an interesting thing. As part of my job here, I get to witness how technology impacts things on a societal scale. And there's this odd relationship between new technologies 
and its nefarious use. Uh, if you actually go back and look at many of the technologies that we take for granted today, like a digital camera, like a VCR, uh, like video streaming over the internet, mobile video, and so on, has been fueled very heavily by pornography, uh, by, you know, at some level, trafficking. Uh, and I think uh, what we tend not to reflect on adequately as people who focus on the technology is the unintended, unplanned use of technology. You invent something because you think you're addressing a problem, democratizing communications. I mean, who could have anything against that? But who embraces this new democratized channel? Well, you sometimes don't think ahead of how your efforts uh, will be abused. So uh, just this morning, I happened to be in a conversation uh, with some colleagues who are visiting from UCLA. Sarah, you're here, right, somewhere? Uh, uh, OK, very good, back there. And uh, we're just swapping stories about uh, how savvy some of the traffickers are about technology. And you know, one of the biggest applications of AI is porn, right? Uh, so you can very quickly find exactly what you want. Uh, uh, everybody's short on time, and so there is a market. Uh, so the design of this system sometimes makes it easy, sometimes makes it difficult. So I think at a, a system level, I think this appreciation of how technology can be used and abused the consequences of uh, the use and its abuse, uh, I think will inform those of us who have largely been trained on understanding how to build technological platforms uh, as opposed to really understanding. So it's happening it's very dramatic. As an engineer growing up, when I was in school and college, we didn't think we were going to do anything that impacted things on a societal scale. We thought we were going to help some corporation make a faster, cheaper, lighter chip. Right? You didn't think that it was for you to get involved and, and, and develop a point of view that impacted your practice. But it's evident today uh, that these systems that we build as technologies have a huge say. So coming back to human trafficking, it is ultimately about communications. This is not a business that thrives in darkness. There are people who are trying to engage with strangers, trying to engage with strangers. That's what is at the heart of this business. It is about communications. It is about smart devices. It's about sensing intentions. Uh, all the things that we try to do as techno technologists, uh, uh, thinking that we are only doing it for the for the good, uh, but not recognizing that it will be abused, uh, and 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 we need to be mindful of that. Uh, so I'm especially keen on learning from people, uh, uh, in particular those that have, to be honest, suffered from it. How could technology have made a difference? Uh, because I think there is thousands of students here and in, in many other campuses that would love to be able to work on those insights and make a real difference. Um, as Neville said, um, my name is Suresh Subramani and I served for six years as the executive vice chancellor on this campus and was responsible for not only the education of our 30,000 plus students, but also their welfare, because I was in charge of uh, student affairs also. So both from that perspective, an administrative perspective, and the fact that I grew up in India, where the daily greeting is not hi or hello, but namaste, which literally means I bow to the divinity inside you. So it really bothers and pains me to see this kind of exploitation, because human trafficking is basically smuggling and trading of people for uh, forced labor or exploitation. And it is based on some of the traits that you've heard about. It is based on fraud. It is based on forcing individuals to do things that they're not uh, uh, wanting to do. It is based on coercion. It's based on exploitation. And it's sustained by fear. And in some cases, fear of death, fear of not only of yourself, but your entire family, as you heard stories about that. So as I... Uh, thought about uh, this in, in my administrative role, you know, and trying to think about what the students needed, it became obvious to me that we teach them book learning, but uh, there was a lot more that the students were hungering for. More than 50%, 53% of the students on this campus do volunteering or internship service of some kind, and they wanted to tackle the big global problems, not the minuscule problems that are in the backyard. They want to tackle 
global problems, and B, send them as, as ambassadors of the university to say, you have uh, uh, graduated from UCSD with the symbol UCSD inside that means something uh, to the rest of the world. So they want to find <coughs> impactful solutions also. So you heard the chancellor talk a little bit about you know, why UCSD, and I want to make the case that uh, San Diego and this area is a cross-border area is both a hotbed and a testbed. And let me just explain what that means. It's a hotbed for uh, almost every problem in the world. It's a microcosm of, of what happens in the real world. So we have you know, illegal immigration, we have drug trafficking, we have human trafficking, we have refugees, we have you know, uh, health, education, and uh, income disparities and uh, inequalities right here. And these are just to name a few, the political turmoil, uh, homelessness, Every problem there is, you know, on some small scale exists right here. And we as experimentalists and scientists and so on, you know, want to uh, put forward ideas and so on, but also test this in, the, in, in, the, in a living uh, environment, right? So the test bed is where San Diego serves as the data collection point, the, the uh, intervention point, and ultimately policy solutions. And we also recognize, and I've often said this to students, that solutions to real world problems don't come in neatly packaged disciplinary boxes, even though we teach math 101 and then chemistry 101 and, and physics 101 and don't tell you all the things that uh, go together, right? So these real world problems really require interdisciplinary solutions and our students really, and, and the faculty and staff also, are hungering for this kind of problem where it takes an entire village and a community to solve that problem. And that means then that the students, faculty, and staff have to come together, but we now have to work with the victims, we work with the community, we work with the law enforcement agency, the government, the policymakers, and the list goes on because we are all touching each other. In the end, it is the whole village that makes this thing work. So I'm a strong believer in the fact that, you know, to to really empower our students uh, and, and uh, make sure that the experiential learning that they're hungering for uh, deals with real world problems, we can show this to them right in the backyard and we can implement solutions. And I would love to, along the lines of, of uh, trying out new technology and so on, really hear almost in an anom anonymous way from the victims to see what is it that we could have done. This touches upon what Ramesh uh, Rao just talked about. And I just want to end with the, the point that, you know, I want to turn this around. All of this really uh, boiled down to me for the fact that the fact we are here today turned out to be serendipity in the sense that a few years ago, we, Naila Chaudhary happened to come on campus for something else, and she said, I'm going to be running a uh, conference on uh, 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 women and children empowerment. And I said, why don't you have it right here at UC San Diego? That led the next year into a conference on human trafficking that was last year. And so every time you know she, she comes up with these ideas, we are all here, my wife supports uh, this, we are a, a good community of friends uh, and uh, faculty here support this. We are in this uh, fully committed to try and help this cause. And it really brings forward something that I want to just uh, come back to for a second. And as one of our goals of our strategic plan is to understand cultures and to, to study inequalities and remove those disparities um, that exist among individuals, right? So if you look back at what is causing this, human trafficking is just a deep reflection of the scars that we have in our society that are inflicted by things like exploitation of other human beings, disrespect for other human beings, and, and just uh, in a lack of dignity, and this is also based on on the fact that, you know, this is driven by poverty. It is driven by the huge uh, inequality gap that arises in education, in income, in healthcare, and so on. And we, as uh, uh, members of this uh, academic community, are commu committed to educating our students about these problems trying to find out solutions. And ultimately, my point is going to be that let's stop human trafficking uh, cold and instead uh, traffic compassion, love, and empathy to the entire world. So I'd like to invite the panel to react to anything you heard from your fellow, fellow panelists before I turn the wild beast loose on you here in a minute. So any, anything that? 
you want to follow up on that? I see one. Okay, go ahead, Dan. I see some uh, potential grants that we can do <laughs> around this with technology and with the students, the energy here on this campus. So thank you. I, ju um, I just want to bring also uh, some related issues. Uh, it's that the, the World Health Organization says that one out of three women in the world are sexually or physically abused in, the, in their lifetime. And you think, well, that's, those are, must be other countries. But here, among college campuses, one out of four uh, female students are sexually assaulted. And I think when we hear these stories about the, uh, the producer in the news that came out last night, uh, having sexually assaulted so many women, um, you know, really uh, respected high-level uh, uh, actresses that uh, never said anything for decades, I think it makes me wonder again about this culture of tolerance and why are we not empowered as girls and women and boys who are sexually assaulted um, to uh, speak out you know, that we're uh, not necessarily trafficked, meaning um, enslaved in those situations, but yet we are because we're not speaking out when it happens. So I think this really speaks to um, a cultural norm that we need to change across the board to address um, this issue because it, it comes down to human trafficking. So many of the victims and survivors have been se sexually abused in their lifetime. It's quite high proportion. I just want to add a couple more statistics. You know, it turns out that 26% of those who are trafficked are children, right? And what uh, uh, what kind of future are we providing for them if if they are the ones who, who, are be, who are being exploited and they have really no say or control over the matter? And this is the fastest growing criminal criminal industry in the entire world, the fastest growing, right? So it comes back to Nyla's point that you know when we talked about climate change and so on. At this rate of growth, it's it's going to uh, completely overpower us if we don't stop and, and uh, take action at this point in time. So I just wanted to jump in and uh, partly to respond to your question, uh, but going back to what Carmen said uh, about human trafficking is a new term that we've come upon. And so we are talking about human trafficking, even though it's been going on for centuries. So I think in you need to have a vocabulary to describe things that you experience as a child so that you can surface it. Uh, so I, I grew up in India uh, and uh, you know I speak uh, various degrees of fluency for Indian languages and I don't think I could actually convey what you're able to convey in English by saying he touched me. There's no way to say this, no way to communicate you know that feeling that somehow your space was invaded inappropriately. You just can't, it doesn't exist. Uh, of course there are words that exist, but it's not commonplace to use those words. So I can imagine in a cross-cultural context that you actually don't know how to express yourself. And so it's much easier to internalize it uh, rather than surface it. So Liana has invited us to think about why this has become a cultural norm and Create, invite us to create a sense of urgency around addressing it. Uh, Carmen reminds us to be an advocate for victims um, and challenges to say, how much do you love somebody else? And if we don't trust the system, we don't trust each other, and we don't have that love for each other and see the humanity in each of one of us, then what are we? Uh, Ramesh reminds us that new technologies bring nefarious uses and suggests that a lot of this is about communications. And the, the technology is a wonderful tool but a horrible master and we, sometimes it takes control over parts of us with unintended consequences and impact. And Suresh is giving us a call to arms to, to have a new trafficking movement, a trafficking movement of love and compassion that can countervail and override and create the new norm um, so that becomes the spirit du jour as opposed to the opposite. What do you guys think? What questions do you have of this panel? How can we today embolden all of us to be agents of change and fundamentally turn the tide on this situation and issue. What are some of your thoughts? You didn't come here just to listen, I know, so. Yes, brother. It's the other side of the equation that we have to deal with the people who are trafficking victims. Is it or is it punishment? I mean, sorry. So the, discussing how to handle the people like Harvey Weinstein, let's name him, 
who who force themselves on their victims and don't have any kind of i don't know conscience may not be the right word but that's what she's talking about it's a cultural norm men think sorry <laughs> men mostly think that they can get away with with it and so how do we tackle that side of the problem anyone like to respond uh, Carmen? well um i am a really fan of education i think everything is in education we should start talking about human rights since we are in the basic level of education um, because we are used to say men or women, but I think we need to talk more about equality. And when we talk about victims, we should put in our minds that victim can be anyone. I have, I know cases where the woman is a trafficker. Okay, so we we need to start breaking stigmas and this kind of prejudice in our minds because it can happen to anyone, and anyone can be a victim. Anyone can be a trafficker. We need to have that in our minds in order to help with equality. And we need to include in the conversation. If we are, talk if we are only women, we need to include the men. If we are um, like we are, I mean, we need to include the LGBT people. We need to include all of them in the conversation. And by the way, doctor, my 13 cases with transgenders, all of them are HIV positive. So it's something also that we need to, to keep in mind. No? The um, transgenders, like I said before, um, I got a, an email yesterday from somebody and she said, I have 20 queers and transgenders in Otay Mesa Detention Center. Can you please help? Can you imagine 20? How am I gonna do it? We need to get together. We need to get together. I mean, I, like I said also, I don't wanna make false promises again to them no, I know I cannot do it. Maybe with the help of you. Neville, I, can, can I just add? Please. So two things that strike me is that uh, the fear that the victim has, you know, even in these cases of, uh, 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 as I mentioned, Harvey Weinstein, these are the people who are coming out now and speaking as are uh, now, uh, you know, world-renowned actresses and so on. Uh, but at some point in time, they felt uh, fear of retaliation, fear of, of, of something that prevented them from coming out and saying things. So, so that's one aspect of it, that, you know, we should do everything possible to uh, get that, uh, uh, f find ways to erase that fear so that if they come out and speak out against it, it doesn't need 50 people to come out all at once uh, you know you have to find a way to to hear the individual voices and the second thing that really uh, uh, and i'd love to have our law enforcement people say something about this because not every one of these turns out to be a, a crime that is prosecutable in a court of law and yet you know those little steps that go along the way before someone starts doing this as a repeated offense uh, it, it's gone too far. So if, if society or our colleagues can nip it in the bud at the first time such a thing occurs, then uh, th this would be wonderful. But unfortunately, that's ex exceptionally challenging to try and do that. You know, I see this, whether it's happening at the university, your colleague, someone says something, and if you don't call them on it, the next, next, next time it, it, it continues. So we need to find both to, to stop it cold at, at the time it starts so that it doesn't propagate itself and even more so, you know, find a way to really help the victims uh, along the way because this uh, atmosphere of fear is what is preventing them from coming out and speaking about it. I'm a community outreach specialist with the FBI and I also was a victim specialist with the FBI for 11 years and a CPS worker before that, so I have a lot of experience with victims and I think that that aspect is really important. I've worked with lots of partners in the community, including Charisma, including Carmen. We've been out on weekends and nights and early mornings and 
all of that is really important, but um, the one thing that kind of stands out to me is that we have to make sure that, and yes, you're right, not all cases are going to get prosecuted, unfortunately, or fortunately, um, depending on what side of the law you're on. Um, there's certain requirements before cases can be sometimes even investigated and then um, charges can be filed. But the biggest step and the most important step is going to be reporting. When you said that you had friends, colleagues at SDSU who had taken their children out of certain schools, the first thing that popped into my head, and you know, I whispered to Todd and he said the same thing was, who did those parents report the recruiting to? Because we want the school resource officers, we want the local police department from whatever area, and the FBI. Um, the, this county is very active in terms of law enforcement. We have a human trafficking task force of all of the agencies in San Diego that are addressing this problem. We want task force officers to go to that school, to talk to those kids who are doing the recruiting of their kids, or to address adults that are lingering and recruiting in other areas, to educate the teachers, to educate the um, professors. So the one thing that I think we can all do here today is make sure that we're not just educating and, and uh, providing services and getting involved in that way, but make sure that when you come in contact with this, that we're encouraging people to report it and to report it immediately, whether it's to the local um, law enforcement agency or to the FBI. Because you know, when you um, hear stories like um, Harry um, Weinstein, Weinstein and all of these women who he sexually assaulted, they didn't report it until now. So none of that got investigated. So maybe they could have stopped him. Maybe we can stop some other kids who didn't have maybe the resources or the parents with the um, ability to move them from those schools where there's traffickers that are coming to recruit young people. So report that information. If nothing else, if a case doesn't get initiated the first time because there's not enough there, we keep records. If we get another case and another case and suddenly we have 10 cases, now we can make a case with all the different pieces and all of the different victims. So make sure that you're encouraging reporting. I think from a law enforcement perspective, that's the most important thing that you can do is educate them because sometimes they don't um, educate people because sometimes they don't see themselves as victims and they don't realize that they're being victimized, that a crime is being committed. And secondly, encourage them to report or report yourselves you know, at whatever level it is. Maybe you won't give us the names or, you know, of um, your colleagues, but please encourage your colleagues to contact us, you know, and let us know so that we can follow up with that. The, the wonderful thing, I know we're trying to end. Well, the wonderful thing is there's been policy after policy or legislation enacted just really recently as, you know, just within the past few months, one after the other, um, so that it makes reporting, um, uh, easier for people and of course the word needs to go out because so much this mistrust uh, with you know with being protected it, it, it's because in the past um, many the children sexually exploited children would get arrested they were filling being fill, filling up juvenile hall well now that's turned around there's now a law that you know to protect them and to provide them services instead um, just recently now um, there's, uh, and I can rattle off all the AB 1227, the schools are now all, <laughs> we just came from an advisory council meeting, so you know, every, so it was only my third meeting, and I've so much, um, the schools are now mandated to do all of, to do all of these um, trainings of all the middle school and high schools in San Diego County. Um, there's three, you know, evidence-based uh, interventions happening, so all students will be getting it. Um, uh, there's a uh, uh, youth court, uh, trafficking youth court that's being set up, RISE. It's just going to be, be started soon. Uh, let's see, the safe harbor laws, we were really slow, California, in adopting that. But again, that's um, not arresting uh, juveniles who are in prostitution and providing them services. And um, just a lot of others, child, child welfare services, and now we're rolling out uh, ident identification of trafficking, because really um, the medical system and the um, child welfare workers um, were just at the level of trying to identify traffickers. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I sense from multiple people we need to move on to the program, so I'm going to have to, at this point, uh, ask you to thank our esteemed panelists. They will be around later. <laughs> and do thank yourself for being here as well.
Yeah, there'll be a chance to ask more questions and connect after this as well. Thank you to all our panelists. I think uh, we had probably one of the most powerful panelists here talking about human trafficking, so thank you. Uh, my name is Julie Matsuda. I am a project manager for social impact and innovation. I would like to introduce this next performance, an expert from No More Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Training put on by Point Loma University's Center for Justice and Reconciliation. Created by the artistic director, Catherine Hannah Schrock, it was developed and inspired by the writings and testimonies of trafficking survivors. Enjoy. I'm 17 years old. We hit it off from the start. I've been doing this since I was 14. Started talking and talking. We would chat for hours every day. I look in the mirror and I don't recognize myself. He was all sweet and romantic. My mom doesn't know. I couldn't tell her what I am now. And he listened to me. They call me a whore. It was like, for the first time, I finally found someone who understood me. Me? Me. Someone who would be there for me no matter what. He's a selfish liar. I remember the first time he picked me up. He forced me into this life, trapped me, rolled up in a Lexus. He gave me drugs so I would get hooked and completely lose myself. He smelled so good. How about a sports jacket? Makes me sick to my stomach. I had butterflies in my stomach the minute I laid eyes on him. Now I don't know how to get out of it. Finally, a real man, a gentleman who would take care of me. I wish I never laid eyes on that selfish son of a... He took me to an elegant dinner. Thinks he's a pops. Had me believe in we were a family. Then he took me to the mall. He spent like $500 on me. He told me everything he was doing was for me. It was like, for the first time, I felt beautiful. I felt taken care of. He told me he loved me. He told me he loves me. I never thought that this would be my life, getting laid for dough. He's the only one who understands me. Money that hurts, money that makes me crazy. And he said he wants to see me again. And his yelling makes me scared as shit calls me name. Said we could go on a nice vacation together. This all feels like a dream. But I don't cry. Not anymore. I wish 
I had never laid eyes on that selfish son of a... He had me believing that we were family. He told me everything he was doing was for me. I never thought that this would be my life. Getting laid for Joe. Money that hurts. Money that makes me crazy. And his yelling scares the shit out of me. Calls me names. But I don't cry. Not anymore. Did it have to end up this way? What could we have done differently? We didn't see it coming, despite the fact that every day before the day, she stopped showing up. Before the day, she and he, despite the fact that we were there, watching her go down slowly, we were there, standing behind her in the lunch line, kind of shy, short hair, but had that big smile. Remember her? She held the door for you, shared her notes with you that week you came down with the flu. Teacher loved her penmanship, but really seemed to mind her poor attendance. Started sleeping in class. She had the bruises, but there were other clues. And it just got worse over time. But still, we didn't see the signs. Or we didn't know what we were looking for, but we were there. We were there. We just didn't know. But here's the thing. While we let one go, she is still here sitting beside you in English class. You know her. You know him. Yeah, he is also a victim. He, he always looks tired. You thought he was just on drugs, lazy, thug. Besides, it's none of my business, right? Is it a choice or a responsibility to see, to say, to work out together what to do, what to say together? We are not alone in this. And she is vulnerable, but not powerless. And he can recognize his allies to distinguish the truth from the lies, to say, no, I'm not fine. We can call out the disguise. It doesn't have to end up this way. And we can still see it coming. So what can we do differently? Because it's going to take all of us together to say, no more. No more tears. No more traps. No more dirty eyes. No more pretending. No more screams at night. No more being controlled. No, no more regrets. No, no more tears. No more game. No more nasty hands on me. No more pain. No more innocence. No more getting beat. No more baby girl. No more loneliness. No more lost boy. No more lost girl. No, no, no more. more. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Kayla Morales, and I am a facilitator of the No More Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Curriculum. Um, our work comes out of Point Loma Nazarene University, the Center for Justice and Reconciliation. And here are a few of our lovely actors, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Shanna Corey, and I just recently graduated from UCSD with um, a degree in, uh, in theater with high honors in playwriting. And my name is Andrew Walters, and I also graduated with a degree in theater uh, and got a Distinguished Artist Award from Marshall College. So what you all just saw was a short drama, which takes snippets from different parts of our drama that we have in the full curriculum. Our full curriculum is three and a half hours long, and um, it is an interactive piece. So we take methods from a social justice theater called Theater of the Oppressed. Is anyone familiar with Forum Theater or Theater of the Oppressed? Yes, a few of you, good. So um, what this means, the most important aspect of this kind of work is that the audience gets to reflect and interact directly with the performance. So that's what we're going to do here tonight. Um, we're going to do a condensed version of it, and we're going to have you engage in some conversation about what you just saw. So go ahead and turn to the person next to you or, or a few people next to you and just talk about what you just saw in this piece. And I'll bring you back in a second. That's why you're giving me a Thank <laughs> 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 you. 
here. <laughs> Okay, a lot of good conversations going on. Sorry, I have to cut them short. So let's bring it back together. And I would love to hear what were some things that were coming up in your conversations. Do we have anyone who would like to share what they just talked about with their next door neighbor? Go ahead. Why did I keep extending my hand forward? Oh, during the movement piece. So we'll get there pretty soon. Is that what was coming on in your conversation? Yeah, could anyone answer that for him, you think? Does anyone have an idea? Well, I think uh, it's because once you're forced in this particular situation, it's so extremely hard to get out of it. And I think it was also that hope that the next time it may not happen, the abuse may not happen. Uh, so, so you'll go back and continue to seek it. Yes, yeah, so what she said before the mic was there was that it's really hard to get out of the situation a lot of times. And so oftentimes you go back hoping that it would change. And then in the movement piece, you saw that there was kind of this cycle that kept on happening. What were some other things that were coming up in your conversations? Just to add to that, I wanted to add yeah. uh, trauma bonding, Stockholm Syndrome, which is an actual mental health diagnosis. Um, and I think we often don't realize that there's also something happening psychologically at play where it's not just so easy to walk away when you know you have this relationship and it develops into something that's really manipul manipulative and coercive and so it's it's not just this very superficial I have the freedom to walk away and oftentimes you don't but um, mentally there's something also happening anyone else that would like to share I have a question. I'm the kind of person who, in the 10 years I've worked here, I've often seen students who seem distraught and are crying, very obviously upset. And I'm the kind of person who will stop and say, are you OK? And never once has anyone said, no, I'm not. They always say, yeah, I'm fine. And so I wonder, as a stranger who sees something is wrong, how do you build the trust with that person who doesn't even know you and, and provide some sort of support or comfort to them. I, I don't know what I'm doing wrong when I ask, are you okay? I think I think I can answer that actually. Go ahead. I think it's about building a bridge. Mm -hmm. I think it's about just offering. I think if you can just offer yourself, I think that's the first step. I think that you, you cannot force you know a person to, to come into your comfort because that would be a, a similar fashion of, of what is already occurring. And I, I feel like that it's all about building a bridge, just allowing them to come in their own time uh, and you know, re like try to find a community. What were you saying? That it has to come from them. Yeah, that it has to come from them, exactly. Like that they have to uh, be ready to make that, that step of, of externalizing, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. Yes, so building a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to move on to the next question. Um, so what did you see during that two, the two girls um, what was their narrative? What did they tell us about trafficking? Anybody? I see a hand. Traffickers are playing on the natural desires, especially for younger girls, you know, to have male attention and to be treated like a princess and a queen. And mm -hmm. they just play into that 100% until they're completely hooked. Yes, so a part of, um, so the average age here is 15 to 16 years old in San Diego County for trafficking. And I'll, research also shows that one of the most common ways to be trafficked in San Diego County is by the boyfriending Romeo approach. So there's this grooming process. There's that, that trust that is being built. And that's part of the reason why it's so hard to get out of it. And then, um, go ahead, one more. I'd just like to add to that, um, that a lack of self-esteem and gaining nothing from perhaps the people in your life or they're the ones causing that lack of self-esteem can make that young woman or that young man very, very vulnerable. Yes. I speak from experience. I had an abusive father. I'm sorry to hear that. So yes, so um, we have to cut the questions a little short. But what I will say is that we do this in middle and high school with middle and high school youth because of the average age here being 15 to 16. 
Um, we also give them a chance during um, this interactive part to come up in the um, show, the drama itself, and reenact the scene so that it goes down a different path and they can change the outcome of it. Um, and we also have a few flyers out there with more information um, speaking on those vulnerabilities that make this so difficult to get out of and easy to fall into, unfortunately. Um, we invite anyone who is a college-aged actor to come join us. There's also information on that flyer with Catherine Hannah Schrock's information. Just email her, and there's more information on how you can get involved with doing this with us. Um, thank you for having us. So for the grand finale of our program, uh, I'm proud to introduce Buki Domingos. Uh, she's the lady that Carmen was speaking about earlier. She is one of Carmen's clients. She's a survivor and uh, she's an incredible singer. She's also a trained nurse, the mother of four boys, ranging in age from what, 20 now? 20 to three. and. Um, she was trafficked on the basis of her talent. So I think she's going to tell you a little bit of her story. But now she is an activist in San Diego. She is, I'm going to read this because um, she's, I, I don't want to make a mistake. She's the board chair of Activist San Diego, a racial and social justice nonprofit organization that has a community radio station on which she co-hosts her own radio show called Alafia, Voices of the African Diaspora. So that's one thing she does. She also works full time as a geriatric nurse and is raising her four boys by herself. So um, she will tell you more about herself, but um, I work with an organization called Alliance for Empowerment and we're very proud to sponsor uh, Buki's performance here today. Um, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Every time I get invited, I strongly believe I am over it. I can have a wonderful performance without any emotions and just sing. But every time it gets closer to the performance, I realize how really traumatized I am and how it will permanently scar me for the rest of my days. I came here to the United States with my three kids under false promises of somebody who was supposed to be my husband. My trafficker was my ex-husband. We, in the middle of the trafficking and the rape and the abuse, had a son who was now my three-year-old and at birth, he did not have any oxygen for four and a half minutes. And today, the result is every now and then he has seizures. I am not, um, there's nothing much they can do about it because I say he's under five years old and he had his last seizure two days ago. I stand here because this is very important to me to be able to stand and tell my story, not for show, but because I refuse to live in fear. My trafficker is still a free man the last time I checked. It was very hard to get law enforcement to even consider persecuting, even after all the evidence. And that is why I'm an activist today, because I seriously feel that skin color plays a big role in who is persecuted. He is the classical alpha Caucasian male and a U.S. Marine. And I strongly believe if he was a, an African-American man, he would be behind bars. So that is my struggle, and this is why I choose to be an activist today, because I am tired of living in fear and I know that for me to be able to 
raise my children in a safe community, the change starts with me. And I need to stop blaming people, pointing fingers, being angry and bitter. I could use all that energy inside of me for good and not be depressed. Every now and then I'm human, it gets to me where I think it might just end if I jumped off the bridge. And then my children remind me every single time why life is worth living and worth fighting for. So I have a few songs today. I didn't sleep a wink last night because I was trying to prevent another seizure because when he has them, it goes really quickly. And um, I'm here today because this is really my heart and my soul. And I know when I sing, I love to party. So I am trying my best not to lose my joy, even if it's not always very easy. So I do have three songs. The first one is a cappella, We Shall Overcome. The second one is, the second one is My Hymn of Survival. And the third one is to leave you on a very thoughtful note on how we can stop human trafficking and how we need to break stereotypes be it racial-wise or gender-wise, because it can happen to anyone, especially for those who have children or loved ones. You might be next. So nobody's immune. So everybody, get up. It's party time. First, we're going to do the big choir thing. We're going to sing. I love singing. I started singing in a choir, and I started with gospel. And the first song is We Shall Overcome. I will sing the first verse, and you'll sing with me. Are we good, Johnny? One, two, one, two. We shall. Come, I'll just keep singing. We shall overcome. We shall overcome. Someday. Overcome someday. Now sing with me. One, two, three, sing. We really nice and sweet. I'm trying to get you to wake up. We all the way back there a little louder. I can hear the lady laughing in the front louder than you guys at the back. Deep. Come on. M. Nice. One more time. I do believe that we shall overcome some. Now I want to ask you to do something that you might not necessarily like. So I hope you're sitting next to somebody you really like. I'm going to ask you to hold hands. And I know that for my kids, because every time I do that, they go, uh, they don't want to do it. OK. Are you ready? We shall. Little louder. We shall overcome. Squeeze the hand gently. We shall overcome. Someday, oh, deep in my heart, I do 
believe. Sing it. There you go. Now we do, we have overcome. Sing with me. We have a little louder. Who said today? Spot on. Whoa, deep in my heart. That we have overcome today. Now, don't be seated. We have the next song coming up, and I hope it works. And I need you to turn my microphone up because now it's party time. And I don't want to have to do it without the microphone. So are we ready? All right. The next song is I Will. Loud, nice and loud. Louder, louder, louder. We're all going to dance. Yeah. Louder, louder. One, one, two, three, and clap those hands. So you're back. Town out of space. I just walked in to find you here without that look upon your face. Should have changed that given love that should have made you leave your keys. I know for just one second you'll be back. have a seat now the last song is a better world yeah you may relax but this song the intention for this song is actually to make you go home today with a thought and think about how you can make a change in your community 
and what you can do to make that change. And if you feel, hey, I was never the one with the bright ideas, Dr. Google, look for a local organization that you can volunteer your free time with. For example, Lions for Empowerment might be looking for volunteers. I don't know. Activist San Diego, we're definitely looking for volunteers. We're in City Heights. We have our radio station. We can take interns. We can take, you know, people to work in the community garden. Just get involved and be as active as you can be. And this song is A Better World, written in, in my darkest hour. And I wonder why the song, the words sound so positive when I was feeling the exact opposite. So here it is, A Better World. Ooh, yeah. Could you turn my mic up, please? Thank you. I know there will be a better place. I know there will be a better world if you reach in your heart and search in your soul and find a better place. For you and me. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you search in your heart and you search in your soul, you will finally find. You have got a reason to grow. I know there will be a better place. I know there will be a better world if you reach in your heart and search in your soul and find a better place for you and me. When you're filled with doubt, you just reach in your soul a better tomorrow. Troubles come and they go. I know there will be a better place. I know there will be a better world if you reach in your heart and search in your soul and find a better place for you and me you and me yeah, i know there will be a better place i know there will be a better world if you reach in your heart and search in your soul and find a better place for you and me. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Feel free to grab a copy of my CDs outside. They're $10 a piece. It's contemporary gospel. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you, Nyla. Thank you, Feroza. Thank you, Suraj. Thank you to Alliance for Empowerment, UCSC, and everybody that has supported me and my children in our struggle to rise above the ashes. Thank you.
All right, guys, I am here to formally thank you all for your participation. There was no bystanders in this event. There's the, the language of victim, perpetrator, and bystanders is no longer part of our lexicon. Uh, we're all part of the solution or part of the problem, and today we've all chosen to, t leadership is a, not a position, but a decision. So I hope today you took a decision to be a leader, to be courageous about sharing their awareness of the issue and being the source of change because we can all be part of that. So on behalf of UCSD and all our wonderful presenters, sponsors, and you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. While we conclude, this is just the beginning of our journey. Know that our doors are open, our hearts are open. We start off with compassion and love. We'll change the world together for sure. Thank you for being here. I'm really, really grateful. Thank you.